Okay, quick instant reaction. Michigan State loses on the road to Illinois. I would say this was a fun game, fun back and forth game. You saw good moments from both teams. I think you saw some bad moments from both teams. I think you saw good moments from both coaches, bad moments from both coaches. All in all, very highly competitive game, a very physical game, which we knew was going to happen. Uh, but ultimately, another loss in the conference for Michigan State. They fall to one and four in conference play. Illinois clinging to hopes to potentially win this league this year. They're, uh, well, technically a full game behind Wisconsin at this point. Three and one, though, still a game above Purdue. Uh, Carter Elliott, everybody's favorite Michigan State fan, is here. How are you feeling, my friend? Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not sure what the exact word is, but I'm left. Like, how do you describe, like, you left something on the table? Like, you didn't, like, you, you, you didn't take advantage of opportunities. I felt like I think I think there's just a lot of missed opportunities in this game. And and look, um, I know maybe a lot of people don't listen to these reactions who follow me on Twitter or whatnot. But like I made a comment about the refereeing, and that was more of an emotional, just like I had to get it out there type thing. I don't really wait. wait, wait we're people. we're back walking that already. It's been ten minutes. Well, th- well, here's here's how I feel about it though. Like I could say that about every college basketball game. Like, like every single one. And when it comes down to it, I'm okay with living with the fact that, like, it came down to who was going to make plays and the ball was in our best player's hands in Tyson Walker and we cleared out for him and he shot a shot that I thought was good. It didn't go in. Um, he had a tough time. Uh, he made some some clutch baskets down the stretch. I don't know if that shin like contusion thing or whatever you had earlier in the second half was bothering him a little bit, but he had some very timely buckets also had some very tough, like shots that rimmed out on him. And that was really the, the story of the game to me. I think there was a lot of missed bunnies um, by a, a multitude of different players, a lot of missed bunnies, uh, some tough shots made, but also some tough shot selection from a few players and the other thing that I would pinpoint is when Tyson went out for that long stretch, there was about a seven to two or nine to two run made by Illinois and Michigan state and coach Izzo were just sitting on three timeouts. And I'm just like, we got to get, we got to regroup. We're, we're having offensive possession after offensive possession. It's getting under five seconds. We're out of sorts. Tyson's not on the floor. And I'm just like, just stop the run right now. Like one of those, they go on a 5-2 run, but you can see stuff's not working. Just stop it right now. And unfortunately, we let it grow. They went on a 9-2 run. I thought that was a pivotal moment of the game in a game that was only won by three points. So it, it sucks that I feel like the story of this game is missed, missed bunnies by Michigan State. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't hate that. There were a lot of missed bunnies, um, or just missed shots in general, like maybe not even missed bunnies. There were missed bunnies, but like, I thought Tyson had three or four really good looks rim out late in this game. Yeah. Just uh, tough. Yeah, and he ended up shooting eight for 17. So it's not like you're kicking yourself that he should have shot better. Or he was below his season average. It just, um, there, there were a lot that were like staggering, like, damn, that was halfway down and didn't go in. Um, I would say from the Illinois side though, like I don't normally when we do a Michigan state recap, especially after a loss, we, we are almost like entirely focused on the Michigan state side of things because of who you are. Um, and I, I think we owe it to Illinois to make sure we get to both sides here. And we will, I, I, got, I got some, I got some Illinois takes too. Okay. What do you got? Well, I just think that, you know, without Terrence Shannon Jr., I think a lot of people thought that this Illinois team might not have a closer, but, like, they have a closer in Marcus Damask. Like, Marcus Damask made some very tough shots down the stretch. I thought he did a great job of adjusting to the double team. I thought the double team was throwing him off a little bit in the first half, and just the physicality of A.J. Hogarth was throwing him off in the first half. But I thought he did a good job of settling into the game, got to the free throw line, finally knocked down some shots, had some really good plays out of the double team and passes. And I I just thought that he did a great job of just kind of almost taking over down the stretch a little bit. Like the ball was in his hands and he was making plays for him. Um, And I think that's a luxury that they have. Like he's a really good, he's an all big 10 type player. And he's a guy who I think can be like the alpha in, in, uh, in the absence of Terrence Shannon. Yeah, so you said in the preview, uh, Michigan State has the best player in this game, Tyson Walker. Illinois had the next few. 
I think that voted correctly in hindsight, although some of Michigan State's role players did play well in this game. The only thing I would say is, oh, while Tyson Walker was the best player in this game, not arguing that, he was. Damask was better than him in crunch time, I thought. Uh, and De- it's not like Damask had the game winning shots or anything like that, but like Michigan State kept looking at Tyson to like hit the big one, hit the big one, go hit the big one this time, hit the big one. And he had the layup with about three minutes left, I think, that either tied it or cut it to one. He had the, the nasty cross to the left, finish, take the contact. And that's the last time we heard from him. And I was, I was sick on that one that he had. He drove baseline and they came over and he kicked it to Jay Nakins wide in the corner. And I thought it was good. And that one, like yeah. that just hurt. That yeah. hurt. And I feel like on the other end of the floor, Damas was kicking out and, and guys were hitting it or Damask was hitting it. So yeah, that comes back to team shooting. Uh, Michigan State five for 19 in this game. Obviously, they've had ups and downs. They were horrendous to start the year. They've been really good since. Tonight was kind of just the cold shooting night for the first time in a while. Is that a sign of things to come again? Or do you think that was just a random bad luck miss game? Um, I, it's, I mean, it's probably a sign of things to come. I think we have two good three-point shooters on this team. And like if those guys aren't hitting like at a high clip, then you can't really expect this team to have a good shooting night. Like we even yeah. got one out of AJ Hogarth tonight, which I don't think you can expect on a game to game basis. Uh, by the way, that last possession by Michigan state, well, I don't know what the hell that was. I'll, I want to get to that. I have some like game script okay. stuff to get All to right. in a moment. I still want to do some profile stuff before okay. that. Um, so something I think is notable um, if, if not why you lost just notable, like I definitely am circling this. Uh, for so much talk about the football pads toughness thing, Illinois got to the line 22 times in this game. Michigan State got to the line seven times in this game. Uh, now, I do think Michigan State won the hustle battle a lot. Like, there were a lot of loose balls that went Michigan State's way. I don't think you could possibly hypothesize that Michigan State didn't want this one. I think they played like they wanted this one, and that showed in a competitive ball game. They just didn't make shots, but I do find it notable. Like, you shoot 15 less free throws than your opponent. Usually, you're not going to win that game. Going mm-hmm. down the line more than that, um, Illinois not only shot more free throws, they shot more threes. 21 threes, 7 for 21 for Illinois. Michigan State goes 5 for 19 from three. So, where are all the shots coming from? Because Michigan State did have a ton more shots than Illinois did, and they had offensive rebounds, so some of these were putbacks. But 31 of Michigan State's shots in this game were two-point shots. You shot 31 twos to 19 threes and seven free throws. I don't think that's a very healthy shot distribution in this era. Um, Now, again, this team doesn't have a ton of shooters. Malik Hall didn't attempt a three tonight. Tyson Walker was one for seven, so maybe he wanted to get to to the rim. He was really good from two-point range. But, like, A.J. Hogard was five for 15 from two-point range in this game. He was six for 19 from the floor. And I get we want him to be aggressive, but if AJ Hogarth's shooting 19 shots for you, isn't that a little bit of a circle that? And that's not great for this team vibe to it. Yeah, but at the same time, like AJ had some real, like I don't, I would say a good amount of those looks were actually good looks. He just was not, I mean, I guess you could play the, he's not finishing them, so they're not good looks, but he just missed a lot of layups, man. Okay. All right. I mean, I guess it's just make your layups then. But I mean, he missed a whole lot of layups. But also, there were some some very tough, tough looks by a couple of people. Honestly, I mean, t- honestly, I thought we did a good. We were missing the easy ones. I thought we actually made some really tough ones. There were some shot attempts where I was just like, "What are, what what is that?" Yeah, uh, the like, Malik Hall shot was clutch late for sure. Um, yeah, like still, just 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 weird. Just tough, man. I'm demoralized. I'm not gonna lie to you. Like, I know, I know we're gonna touch on both teams, but like the one and four in the Big Ten thing just like just sucks. Well, yeah, one, and four, one and four, nine and seven overall. My brother, it's embarrassing. One and four in the Big Ten. Like, it's it's time somebody says it. You gotta fire Jawan Howard. This is unacceptable. It's embarrassing. Um, I personally won't stand. I cannot imagine being a fan of a team that's one and four in conference play and just sitting idly by saying that's okay. Like I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly great with that. Can't imagine it would never be me. Get Juwan Howard out of here. Um, 
Who are, yeah. who, are, who are Michigan's conference losses to? Oh, we're doing – that's – Ryan Lyon did that in the Discord too. So we're, we're doing strength of schedule in the conference when your only conference win is Penn State at home. That's what we're doing? Hmm. I'm just saying. Real, real, you, know, you do realize you have to beat somebody that's not Penn State at some point to make the NCAA tournament, right? We do I, know that. Yeah, okay. I do. All right. Um, I'm just, uh, just y'all, y'all, y'all lost to Indiana. I mean, this is not a Michigan episode, so let's let's. Well, it's I, I if we if we have to do the comparison game between my program's worst season since I've been alive with a coach we all want fired with a point guard that's academically suspended, and then your team that was preseason top five with a Hall of Fame coach that nobody wants gone, we can do that. Like, probably should be a little bit of a gap there in conference performance, but. Uh, I'm sure I'm sure that will level itself out once we play the Maryland of the world, you know, things like that. I would certainly hope so. I mean, who did, who did Michigan beat in conference this year? Iowa at Iowa. Iowa at Iowa. Okay. Which uh, is not the easiest place to win, as we both know. So yeah, I, they're tough. Yeah. Um, look, you're going to get wins. I'm not saying you won't. The schedule really opens up here. You're going to beat Michigan twice for sure. But let me enjoy my fun while I can, because I Please. just. I can't Please. imagine sitting idly by one and four. Like, let's go get them next week. Uh, anyways, uh, Illinois, the, the, the schematic thing of this game was Ty Rogers. Uh, we speculated all week that Izzo would not put a center on Ty Rogers. We begged him to do it. We thought it would work. We thought it. it's not just Zach Eady. Any center on Ty works. Uh, then first possession of the game, Mati Sissoko is guarding Ty Rogers. First possession of the game, Ty Rogers kind of tried to post up, went nowhere, kicked out, nothing happened. I was ready to get the Twitter fingers going. I was in the Discord like, this ain't going to work. This ain't going to work. Then Ty Rogers bust every Michigan State Center's ass for the next 19 minutes of the first half. Ty finishes with what I think was one of the best games of his season, uh, 15 points, 6 for 8 from the floor, 3 for 4 from the free throw line. He didn't do all the other little Ty Rogers things that we're used to. Like, he only had one rebound in this game. He had no assist in this game. But it was very clear that Brad and Ty made that a focal point this week to essentially um, work on, like, the floaters. Like, he he was aggressive in hunting his shots and finishing when the centers were just lagging back. Now, I said I would give Tom Izzo credit on this. I still think it's the right thing to do schematically, even though it didn't work great tonight. It was interesting to see how Illinois countered it. But I still think it was the right thing to do schematically, and I give Tom Izzo credit for doing it. What do you make of the Ty Rogers versus centers thing? Uh, I, I I was truly impressed with Ty and the way that he actually counteracted it because we talked about it after the the recap. Where we're like, you can't play Ty Rogers until he can have some type of floater or a semblance or a counter to them putting a big man on him. And look, no Michigan State center is Zach Eady. That definitely made it a little bit easier to for him to attack the rim and do floaters and things like that. But I thought he was great and he was great moving off the ball. He was uh, doing some things as far as floaters and finishes around the rim to counteract uh, to counteract the center being out there. And more so speaking to Michigan State centers in general, I thought they were absolutely atrocious tonight defensively, like absolutely terrible in every single aspect. They were terrible guarding Ty Rogers. The the double teaming of Damas when you're like completely turning your back and giving up wide open layups and drop offs was just awful execution. Um it was uh, it was just it was a terrible defensive showing uh by the big men in this game. It was probably even worse offensively too, right? <laughs> like Yeah, I mean at least at least like Madi caught a ball or two and finished an offensive rebound. Yeah. Yeah. Um but Look, I mean, Jack, Jackson Kohler had three minutes. It was the worst three minutes I've seen in a while. Can't <laughs> feel bad getting on the kid. It's his first time back, like uh, after his foot surgery or but whatever. But like, I mean, that was just a, a very negative three minute stretch there. Uh, Carson Cooper showed that his feet were in cinder blocks early on in the game as Ty Rodgers did a fake hesitation. He just watched him go right by him and dunk the ball. Uh, it was, yeah, it was saying, uh, that not to catch up. Sorry to cut you off, but the, this just isn't IMG's B team anymore with Carson Cooper. Like, and when you when you play guys that belong on IMG's B team in the non conference, Carson Cooper can have some flashes. When you play the second best team in the Big Ten, and you become the focal point of the scheme defensively, which you are, like it's a big ask of whatever centers on Ty Rogers, right? That's not a guy they normally guard. It's the unconventional quirk to it. 
Carson Cooper's not built for that. He's not capable of that. And um, Mahdi probably isn't either, to be honest, even though we try to make it seem like it was easy. But it just, uh, it's, yeah, all credit to Ty, all credit to Brad Underwood for the work that they did this week to be more prepared for that. We, I could not have been more wrong. I could not have been more wrong on the the centers are just going to work against Ty Rogers. We'll see if that keeps translating against Ben or I, I would, I would, I would keep that theory still going uh, with centers that are Michigan State centers. Just monitor yeah. it. We'll hold some stock on that. Just, since, just a uh, wee bit. Michigan State has one of the worst front courts in this league. Yeah, numbers on the front court stuff for Michigan State. Mati Sissoko, four points and 10 rebounds tonight in 23 minutes. At least he rebounds. Carson Cooper had zero points and two rebounds in 16 minutes. I mean, what, what do you do with that? I don't know what you do with that. Jackson Kohler, uh, it says here that Jackson Kohler played one minute and had one turnover, according to Ken Palm. You uh, – affectionately referred to that as one of the worst three minute stints you've ever seen. So uh, uh, I, the yeah. Worst it, one minute stints I've ever seen. Last thing I'll say on the bigs, this is going macro with it, but like it is really painful to look around this league for me and see teams that are going nowhere that picked up players that could really help this Michigan state team to name a few Ben Creek, a Cricky at Iowa. Like that, that dude's a really, really gifted offensive scoring piece. And I don't know what he'd give you defensively, but like he's just wasting away with Fran McCaffrey. Olivier Kamwa is wasting away. I feel so bad for that kid in an arbor right now that he has to deal with what Juwan and Doug are putting him through. Olivier Kamwa would make y'all incredible immediately the moment that he came into your front court. Um, this team's actually going somewhere, but he's the best example. Rank Mast was easily gettable. Like any anybody could go and get rank mass that's a better program than Nebraska and give Fred Hoiberg credit for doing it. But like, it's just so ludicrous looking back on it that Tom sat on these dudes for the third straight year, man. We had all the evidence on who these guys are. He refused to upgrade it. He thought that he was smarter than everybody else, even though the results were screaming. The results were screaming in his face. This team has been an average Big Ten team for two years because of the center spot. And it doesn't matter. Like, it, it to me, look at what you got from the other four starters in this game, Cart. Malik Hall, 14 points efficiently. A.J. Hogard didn't shoot the ball great, but he showed up, was aggressive, got you 16. Jay Nakins goes three for seven from three, gives you 13 points. Tyson Walker, 17 points tonight, even as he was dealing with his issues. You're never going to get more production out of those four guys collectively in a game. And you got nothing from the center spot again. And nothing from the bench, too. Trey Holloman can slide out of this. He looks like he's disappeared from what he showed in non-con. So I just – it's it's such a limited roster is how it feels to me. Because now you're lo- – this is the third loss going back to Wisconsin, Nebraska, and now this, and Northwestern, to be honest with you. So – well, no, not Wisconsin. Nebraska, Northwestern, this. Where I feel like you've gotten good performances from your good players. It's just not good enough because there's holes elsewhere. Do you agree with that? Yeah, you said outside of Northwestern, right? Uh, I had it as Northwestern, Nebraska in this one, where I think you got good performances from your good players and you lost the game. Well, uh, are, are not, we call, are, not Malik Hall. I, I said, are we, are, where, where does he fit in on this? That's a, that's a genuine question. I don't know. I, would you even define him as that at this point? He had the clutch Vetti shots late, but like, yeah, but to me, to me t- he's a below average Big Ten starter. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. I'd, I'd say that. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I'm not trying to be like all doom and gloom, but I'm just kind of like lost with this, with this, like, this is the team. Yeah. Like this is, this is it. So maybe we shift to more Illinois talk. Um, big win for Illinois, especially coming off that, uh, loss to Purdue. Obviously this was a very gettable game. I actually had someone tag me in a tweet before this. Um, amongst the other Illini fans that are letting me have it right now, rightfully so, um, that Illinois didn't practice at all this week because uh, they had a bunch of guys sick. So credit to them for coming in with no practice this week and um, I think doing a good job of executing the game plan and getting a win at home. 
Yeah, I want to give credit to every player that played in the game for Illinois tonight, minus Luke Goody, who missed a free throw late. You're supposed to be my shooter, and you miss a free throw late, so I can't cover three and a half. I can't play my music on a three and O day. I'm finally wait, wait, above would that been a Would that have been a music play? Missed it by a half point because Luke Goody missed a front end, Carter. Ah. That's what happened. It was disgusting behavior. Disgusting behavior. Um, but yeah, no, everybody played well for Illinois. Like this, this is just a good basketball team. They're still yeah. my national championship pick. I'm not running from that. This is still my national championship pick. Um, they need the star back and we're not going to comment on that until we get closer to what we think could happen there. But, um, I love what I'm seeing. I love what I'm seeing from the guys. A couple of big moments in this game late to talk to you about Izzo drew up nothing in the last time out. I loved it. I'll say that. I I'm, love I'm it. not mad about that. Yeah, I'm not mad about that. Nothing, though. Like, I'd rather just Tyson just I, – I love the shot. I don't care. Like, that's who needs to be shooting it. I don't care. I love the shot, too. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it much more than running a 24-year-old set, too. Loved it. Now, with that said, I don't know that you needed to call a timeout to do that. And you give Illinois a chance to set their defense. The only reason you do with this team is because it's this team. Okay. Like, you need to calm Mahdi down, make sure he doesn't run and hurt somebody. You need to tell Malik where to go. You need to make sure AJ doesn't just go ahead and just do whatever he wants. Honestly, he probably wanted to get the ball out of AJ's hands before AJ got to do, do a chance to shoot the ball. Yeah. So with this team, I'm not mad at the call. Okay. I'm not mad at it either, but I do just think in general, like if the play going forward is just going to be like, give it to Tyson and get out of the way, would prefer they work on not needing a timeout to set the defense for that. Cause it's, it's a very easy thing to do to raise a fist and give the ball to Tyson Walker. Um, and I do think it probably would have a better advantage for Tyson if Illinois had not had a timeout to talk about their defense before that. Uh, the other one that I thought was really interesting, Michigan state was down one. With uh, 35 seconds-ish left, they they could have guarded. They could have played defense for a full possession. There's about five-second difference between the game clock and the shot clock. It looked like they were going to play defense. They let about 10 seconds run off the clock. Marcus Damas was just dribbling at half court. And then Izzo gives the signal to foul. They take a foul. Marcus Damas is a great free throw shooter. He makes two. Were you okay with how that was handled? I was okay that we were fouling to extend the game. I think the fouling to extend the game could have been executed better. How would you have liked to see it? Uh, well, with that, I mean, I'm not, I, I'm a, co I'm not a coach or anything like that. But I probably would at least try to get a trap, maybe, or something to get the ball out of the best free throw shooter's hands. Uh, maybe like some full court pressure or something like that. Um, to, to you know, throw it off after the basket. I just, I just. I, I think you had to extend the game there because I think there was a seven second difference. I think it was like 35 and 27 seconds on the, I want to say a seven second difference. Okay. I thought it was five for the record. Okay. I, thought, it, I thought it was, right, it might, it, if it was five for sure or seven, I don't want that last shot that they take. Like you got to extend the game right there. So the extending the game situation, I, you do that, but you got to do something to not foul the best free throw shooter on the floor. I would have trapped or something. Yeah, I'm trying to think who was in the game for them at that point that would have been better. Because the thing is, like, everybody on the floor is a pretty good free throw shooter for Illinois. Like, yeah, but like, it, I, I think they had Gary A. Harmon, Goody Coleman. Like, there's some other options there. Aren't all those guys great shooters in theory, though? Like, other than Coleman, Coleman's probably the iffiest from the line. I mean, they are they are less. They are not 88 percent free throw shooters like Damask. They're they're not Damask. Yeah, they're so, not Damask. You know what I'm saying? Uh, what I think mattered the most there was that you had 35-ish seconds to work with of the game or whatever was on the shot clock, right? 30. You had time to work with to try and force a steal. Yeah. It's not, it's not like you're down five and you need to get fouls as quickly as possible. It's like, hey, we have these crazy guards that can get after you. Like that's – that's what I would have liked to see is like use the speed, the quickness, the athleticism of Hogard and Akins and Walker to try and wreak havoc for about 15 seconds and then take one if you can't. Because this, again, remember, Car, this is an Illinois team that truly doesn't have a real point guard. So if there was ever a time that I would think something like that could work, it would be in this exact matchup in this exact spot. 
I thought everyone was just a little frazzled. And uh, ultimately, I agree with Izzo calling to foul. I don't agree with 10 seconds off the clock. And then, de- like, at that point, if you let it go 10 seconds, it's almost better to just defend at that point than me, th- than to foul the best free throw shooter on the floor. So, I, I yeah, just a little. I thought Izzo did all the right things in this game for the most part. I was frustrated with the timeout before Walker's ISO and then the way he handled the foul stuff. Like just the late game stuff just felt sloppy for Michigan State to be. Yeah, especially it's it sucks that you're having sloppy late game things with a bunch of guys who have played over 50 college basketball games. Yeah, and it just it felt like a lot of looking around, like what are we supposed to do instead of like a player-led team where it's like this is what we're supposed to do. Like there's – people have kind of insinuated with Michigan State, like where's the dog? Where's the – Tyson's the dog. But I don't know that they have like the coach on the floor type. Like Tyson's just like a man, I'll, I'm a bust your ass guy. They mm. need somebody who's really like Izzo reincarnated – in one of their five players. That's what some of their best teams have been. And AJ's definitely not that. I don't think Tyson's that. So it leaves him in a weird spot. Um, last couple of things, pregame, we uh, we did who are the best players on this floor. And we said Tyson, then three from Illinois. Would you revise that at all after tonight? Probably not. I think the only revision I would consider is would you put Ty Rogers above who you had at five, which was AJ Hogard. I mean, I, are we just going off this game? Because I mean, like Ty Rogers was on play. Who, who would you want for the rest of the season? I probably would still want AJ Hogard to be honest with you. Okay, I'm surprised by that because you have been very low on AJ from time. I had, I, I have been, but I just thought he missed a lot of bunnies. I don't think. Ty's doing this against anybody else, to be honest with you. I think that the the method of putting the center on him will actually work with good with serviceable centers. I, I still think that's a little harsh, man. Like, I don't know. I he's not gonna score 15 every game, but like he just does so many good little things, man. Like, I really watched him in this game with an eye on just him. He does he does for sure. I I agree with that, but sometimes it's hard to put him on the floor when he's a complete zero. If he does what he does tonight, it makes everything so much better because like you could see the other little things. But when you can't play him like you did the Purdue game, and I guess Brad did say like that was that was a one time thing. It's not going to work against other other teams. I would love to see, if I see it work against another team that's not Michigan State with their bigs. I'll be a believer in it. But yeah. until then, I put a little TBD on it. I'm going to just say I think it works because there were moments where he was even like off ball kind of in the dunker spot or floating to the corner a little bit. And I there was one specific player I remember somebody kicked out to him and Ty was cutting and he caught it in the air and in the air on his cut, he turned his body and hit a shooter on the opposite wing. Like he just he's so fluid as a passer and he can do all these little things even uh I don't know. He is a really versatile piece and he's going to get really good, man. He's only a sophomore. He's going to get really, really good. That's a, and he's just a winning player. Like even if he has his limitations, like he helps Illinois win in a lot of ways. So I was really impressed. We have to eat some crow there. Not a Dane game. You've said every game's a Dane game. Dane put this exact front court in the torture chamber in this building last year. He can only get five minutes tonight car. What the hell's that? Yeah, Dane was pretty tough defense, uh, pretty uh, atrocious defensively in this game. He had a couple of breakdowns that led to uh some baskets, but also big fella ran the floor and got an and one. <laughs> if they put Dane out there, he would have had 20 and 10 tonight. I love so much that Dane only needs five minutes to have the play that gets you excited. It happens every game. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm already in Dane's DMs talking about you look good in green and white. <laughs> like I'm talking about you, if you have any leftover stuff from Baylor with green on it, like, let me know if that works. Bring it. Like you can come next season. We got 30 for you. Did Dane get worse? No. Illinois got Illinois got better. Illinois got better. Yeah, I like that. Uh we have to give some love to Coleman Hawkins as well. Our boy Coleman, who uh Bro, he was he was so good defensively. He's he insanely good so defensively. Good. Insanely good. He had the block the very first possession of the game that was just emphatic. Uh he, he finishes this game with four blocks, two steals, seven rebounds, two assists, and 15 points to go with it. Three threes. Like this was the full Coleman Hawkins experience. This is why. People are always going to believe in this guy, even when he puts up a stinker, because when he's good, it's so good. Yeah, he was everywhere defensively. Hands were active. Uh, he was checking one through five, the blocks, 
every I mean everything. He was he was he was really good tonight. Do you love active hands? I love active hands as a big. Active hands are massive as a big. Do you have active hands? I do have active hands. I got it because my foot speed isn't where it needs to be. So I got to be sneaky with my hands. Do you think I have active hands? I actually think you probably do. You were a tennis player, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that would I, that would help you out with like, you know, hand speed. I'm sick. You had to ask if I was a tennis player. Like, like you don't know that already. I mean, I'm I'm also very sad right now. I don't know if that's coming across <laughs> the microphone. Like I'm in hell right now, man. Like I'm not right. I'm not feeling good. I don't I really I love you like a brother, but I do not want to be here. I'm Carter, it could be worse. Tyson Walker could be ruled academically ineligible and miss the next six away games. That could happen, but it's not going to because you have a program with a pulse. It is what it is. It's okay. Uh, I have one final big picture thing on Michigan State, and then we can wrap and get you out of here. I tweeted this. You may have seen it. Maybe you didn't, but um, it's a thought I can't help shaking the more and more that I watch this team. And I said I would bring it up if it, if they lost to Illinois. There's a moment every single season where I think this is going to be the year they missed the tournament. Mm-hmm. It's happened at least once each time in the last three seasons. And some of them have been more dramatic than others. Some of them, like Michigan State's had good teams in these last three years. So it's not like from the jump, I'm like, they're going to miss it. It's just you get to a point where they've lost a couple in a row. You're like, well, if they kept losing, this would happen. I think this moment in time right now is the most likely I have ever seen a Tom Izzo Michigan State team to missing the tournament other than the Aaron Henry team with two weeks left in the year. Yeah. And Aaron a, Aaron, Aaron Henry had to address it. Like they, they had to look the cameras in the eyes and be like, we're aware of what's going on. And Aaron Henry made his case for the MSU Hall of Fame in those final two weeks as a leader and what he did on the court and what he said off the court. It was impressive. Right now, though, in January 2024, is the closest we've been to that point. Nine and seven on the season, one and four in the conference. The only win of any substance whatsoever is Baylor on the neutral. That's a great win. Indiana State's fine, but if Indiana State's your second best win on Friday, January 12th, excuse me, but your resume stinks. Um, they have work to do, according to everything right now. Like, no, there isn't going to be a service that projects this team in the NCAA tournament based on what they've done. But today. It's weird, though, because, like, in all, like, the metric sites, like, we're all we're up there on all the metrics. Like, net, I haven't checked after this game, but coming into this game, like, net, top 25, Ken Palm, top 25, for Vic top 25 like all those are all the metrics are just because I guess maybe we don't have any like devastating losses like bad losses maybe that's why but like we're top 20 before the game when I did the the preview we were top 25 in all major yeah. metrics yeah you still are I believe you're 17th on Kempo it's just um, it, makes, it makes no sense to me <laughs> Yeah, I think I, a lot of that is if you if you win your games in blowout fashion and you lose your games in close game fashion, that helps a lot. Like, what's their closest win this year? They've won every game by double digits, I believe, right? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Yeah, and most of them by 20-plus points. Like, Baylor was a 24-point win. Uh, Indiana State ended up being 12. They blew – like, every win's been a blowout win. The losses haven't been, like, one-point losses usually. This was their closest loss of the year, but – They've been close. They've been mostly single digits other than the Wisconsin game and the Northwestern game. So, like, yeah, you're right. If they suddenly start winning the games, they're they're going to be fine because the analytics are there. But the resume-wise, there's obviously work to do. With that said, I am declaring this the official moment that I think this could happen where this is the year where they miss the tournament. I know that doesn't sound great to hear, but I think it's a real possibility. And with that said... I have a larger takeaway that is this. How is it even possible to miss the tournament with Tyson motherfucking Walker? Like, the dude that that guy is this year is so good. Look, because you want to know why? Because the class of 2020. That's why. Can I add something to that? Can I can I say one last thing? Yeah. Are we, I, I, I hate attacking kids. I truly do. And I'm sorry if this is going to come across as attacking because it is. And it is. It, and I'm sorry about it. Outside of Tyson Walker, this team is full of losers. 
They are. They All are right. losing. I don't, are, I don't endorse this message. They are losing. They are losing basketball players. Sorry, they're not losers. They are losing basketball players. They are average basketball players. Every single year is a, an okay basketball player, like an okay basketball season. So not yeah. lose, not losers as persons or something like that. I'm just saying they don't play. They're not winning basketball players. Can I give you a different way to say that that I think is more accurate than loser basketball players? Yes, yeah, sure. They're bad basketball players. Like y- y- bad basketball players lead to losses. It's not like they're, they're these aren't good players that are losers. These are these are mediocre. They, like if you put these guys on Rutgers, we would think they're Rutgers. <laughs> well, that answers your que- that that's what that answers your question though. That's that's how you missed the tournament with Tyson but Walker. That's it's just crazy to me because like I've looked at it the past couple years, even to the Aaron Henry year. No offense to Aaron Henry, but I feel like there hasn't been a star I've believed in as much as Tyson. And you can correct me if I'm wrong on that. But like last year's team, Tyson wasn't as good as he is right now. The year before, nobody was this good. The year before was the Aaron Henry year, and Aaron Henry got great late. So, like, it just stars to me when you have a super, superstar. Like, people do think Tyson Walker could be a top 10 player in the country or is a top 10 player in the country. Like, it would be baffling to me if he's the guy. Like, if Tyson Walker's senior year team was the team to not do it for Michigan State, it would make no sense to me. He's one of the best Michigan State players I've ever seen. And – I think it, it's a rather loud indictment on the rest of the roster, which you and I are both saying in various ways. You're saying that it's it's filled with losing players. I'm saying it's filled with bad players. But however you want to frame it, it's like it's Tyson Walker and it's nothing else. And you pointed out the 2020 class, Cart. Um, do you mind if I read some recruiting classes to you real quick? Sure. Your 2020 class was Madi Sissoko and A.J. Hogard. What grade would you give that if you were grading that class and what they have given to Michigan State now? A D. A D. Okay. 2021 was Max Christie, Pierre Brooks, and Jaden Akins. You C. got one You got one year out of Pierre, two horrible years out of Pierre Brooks, and now I guess two years of starter Jaden Akins. C. C feels fair to me. If you could have kept Christie, maybe things look differently. 2022, your class was Carson Cooper, Jackson Kohler, and Trey Holloman. D. That's an F. I'm sorry, but that's that's the worst class I've seen. Other than if Trey Holloman blossoms, but like that's a it's a flat out failure. And I, I think this year's class should not avoid this. You're getting nothing from Xavier Booker, Cohen Carr, Garrick Norman, and unfortunately, it's not his fault. But Jeremy Fierce, like this was supposed to be the class that brought this team back to the top five immediately. You're getting nothing from them. What'd you get? Seven minutes tonight. Like, I just I don't get I don't get why either because I thought that Carr's minutes out there were actually productive in the game. Right. It just it baffles me, man. Like we we're going back all the way to like the 19s now. The last time that Tom Izzo's had a recruiting class that has actually contributed on the court quickly, like, and if if you're not gonna play the transfer game, don't you have to get immediate impact players like? How, you have to do one or the other, right? If your freshmen aren't going to be ready, then go get me some old dudes who are ready. But he won't. He doesn't do either. So, and if if card if this last class isn't ready, what class is going to be ready? You're not getting a better recruiting class than this past class. <laughs> if you if you don't want to, I'm gonna quote one of my one of my one of my early on AAU coaches. If you don't want to play the game. Take take your ball and go home. Is that you saying what I think you're saying? You don't want to play the game, take your ball and go home. Hey, like I said, one and four in the Big Ten, man. I'm ready to fire my coach. I would not fire my Hall of Fame coach if I were you. I would not, I would not, I'm not, I'm not saying you fire him either, but if you don't want to play the game, take your ball and go home. Okay. Is it time for you to take your ball and go home from this recap? It is time for me to take my ball home and go away from this recap. Good win, Illinois. You guys are really, really good. Um, sorry if this came across as just like a Michigan State like episode session. You guys are really, really good. And it was a good win by you guys. Who wins the Big Ten? 
uh, Purdue right now. Okay. If Illinois gets redacted back, they win the Big Ten. Okay. I think Illinois against Purdue is a massive answer to who wins the Big Ten. I think they'll be playing for a title. Uh, all right, Cart, hang in there. ILL. I can't get one. Mm -mm. Maybe tomorrow. We'll see you next week.